subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go today a new question has been posted in our weekly answer writing program that is in synchronization with the dns this question is of 15 marks to be written in 250 words attempt the question track the time taken to write the question post it either you can type or better would be to write on a piece of paper and upload the image in the portrait format the learning from the dns will be enhanced if you participate in this answer writing program so pull yourself up maintain your tempo write the answer get it reviewed and enjoy the learning process we are going to have a discussion on today's newspaper the hindu delhi edition dated 17 june 2021 we shall pick up articles important for civil service examination and discuss them as per the demand of the exam The articles that we have picked up for today's discussion are there on your screen and the time stamping for the same has been given in the description section. Let's begin. This is a lead article from page number 6. Energy efficiency can short circuit cooling India. Short circuit here has been used in a sense of derailing a process. The process is implementing cooling equipments like coolers and ACs. If energy is not used efficiently, then this entire process can be derailed there is global warming happening climate is changing temperature is rising and with rising temperature rising temperature related disaster and calamity is also increasing the article gives the data that in last 3 decades there has been 660 heat waves across india with rising frequency of these rising temperature related calamities there would be increased demand of cooling equipments to keep indians productive and healthy the article points out that india cooling action plan has projected that air conditioners room acs their numbers is set to increase four fold in next 10 years and 10 folds in next 20 years so there is obviously going to be huge demand in the air conditioning systems but then there is a conundrum as has been identified in the beginning of the article conundrum is a confusing situation in which decision making becomes difficult the conundrum here is as the cooling demand is going to increase the energy consumption is also going to increase and if you are not going to increase the efficiency of energy consumption then you will end up accelerating climate change that will in turn demand more cooling system and that will in turn accelerate the climate more So to come out of this conundrum we have to find ways and means in which we can increase the efficiency of our ACs the background that the article has laid for us clears the path to have a comprehensive holistic discussion on energy efficiency we'll discuss this topic of energy efficiency in compassing the syllabus of economy and environment from gs paper 3 first of all energy efficiency means that we are going to use lesser amount of energy and lower greenhouse gas emission to produce a given amount of output in terms of power that means without affecting the power of a equipment we are going to reduce the energy consumption and that's how it will become efficient so energy efficiency has two component one is about reducing the energy consumption and hand in hand it is also about reducing the consumption of greenhouse gases To put things in perspective I'll give you a data from a report of Niti Aayog India's energy intensity declined from 0.158 KOE per dollar KOE here is kilowatt oil equivalent this is a unit to measure energy intensity kilowatt oil equivalent means that how much kilowatt of power you are generating if an equivalent amount of oil would have been used in the process basically different fuels can be used for different processes you can use diesel petrol you can also use cng but to have a common unit this koe is defined called as kilowatt oil equivalent you don't have to get into it but koe per dollar signifies is that how much power output you are having for 1 dollar of money that you are spending previously the power was expensive it was 0.158 koe in 2005 in 2016 our energy efficiency improved and energy intensity decreased we came down to 0.122 koe per dollar from 2005 6 to 2016 in a decade we had a jump of 22.8% in terms of energy efficiency 
but there are room for improvement looking at the data from other developed countries. For example, the same data for UK in 2016 was 0.074 KOE per dollar. UK is almost 45% more efficient than India. The data for Germany was 0.101 KOE per dollar. So a lot remains to be achieved in the area of energy efficiency in India. It is important that we do achieve these targets because reducing energy intensity, increasing energy efficiency is the answer to the conundrum of emission mitigation versus development. See, we need development. The HDI index of India is still very low. The energy consumption is still one third of global average. More than 300 million people in India are without electricity. Development is our need. We cannot be behind in the development story. The fifth five-year plan calls for a faster, sustainable and more inclusive growth. Per capita energy consumption, in fact, is a very good indicator of developmental stage of a nation. This graph maps the countries against energy consumption per capita versus human development index. And you can see countries with higher human development index, for instance, countries with score higher than 0.8, their energy consumption is high. If you look at countries like Israel, Italy, UK, France, Japan, Germany, they are in this range. Energy consumption of Australia, US, they are even high. Energy consumption of Canada, Singapore, Kuwait is even higher. And countries with HDI index lower than 0.8, they considerably have low energy consumption per capita, with African countries like Nigeria, Kenya having very low consumption. Even India is not far ahead. This is the trajectory that the countries follow. When their HDI index improves, their energy consumption also improves. Or rather, it is actually the other way around. When the energy consumption per capita improves, then the HDI index improves. Our energy consumption per capita is one third of global average. We need to increase this. But we have to increase it keeping in mind our NDC targets. One of the targets in NDC is to reduce GDP intensity by 40% of 2005 level. So we have to become an energy efficient economy. How can we continue to be on the trajectory of growth and development and still achieve this target? The answer to that is energy efficiency. Becoming energy efficient, developing equipments that are energy efficient will do lots of saving. According to the data released by Bureau of Energy Efficiency, which is a statutory body working under the Ministry of Power, around Rs 53,000 crore were saved because of energy efficiency measures that were taken in one annual year alone, 2017-18. And 108.25 million tons of CO2 emission was reduced. So when the cost decreases, the energy will also become more affordable. Apart from that, we do have constraint on energy generation capacity. So it's not that we can generate as much energy as we want. We have to be energy efficient to meet our needs in the given amount of output of energy that we are able to produce. The pressing need of energy efficiency is still higher looking at the future demand of energy. We are at the cusp of advancement in many technological fields like Internet of Things. They will require lots of energy. So the energy need of the future can only be met if we use energy efficiently. Government of India has taken lots of effort to increase energy efficiency in Indian economy. I'll list down the steps taken by Government of India in brief in the manner and the way that you can use in the mains answers. I have done this exercise with you lots of time before and we are doing it yet again. I'll give you the structure in which you must proceed writing the efforts taken by government in any field. The structure must begin with policy. Policy gives guidance. From policy comes out legislation. From policy comes out the actions to be taken by institutions. From policy comes out the aims and the motives and the purpose of schemes. From policy comes out the ground on which collaborations are taken up by institutions nationally and internationally. Policy is the lighthouse. From here the ship gets its direction. Government of India has come up with national mission for enhanced energy efficiency and various initiatives have been taken up under this umbrella. Bureau of Energy Efficiency has come up with a strategy document called as Unnati, which stands for Unlocking National Energy Efficiency Potential. 
and a road map has been laid in this document for making India an energy efficient economy. Government of India also has a national policy on biofuels. The policy asks for mixing of hydrocarbon fuels with biofuels that will not only increase the usage of renewable energy but that also makes the fuel more efficient. There is also a legislation in place called as Environmental Conservation Act 2001. There is a provision in this legislation that says that government can take measures and give directives to institutions with regard to increasing energy efficiency in India. And the measures and the guidelines that you see, they all are empowered through this legislation, Environmental Conservation Act 2001. Using this legislation comes various regulations. One of the regulation is called as CAFE, Corporate Average Fuel Efficiency. This concept began in the United States of America and the concept is to direct the corporates, the automobile companies to curb vehicular pollution in terms of carbon dioxide and to increase the mileage of the vehicles. This CAFE in general is concerning the regulation of CO2 emission. But the Bharat stages, as you know, has come to the stage of 6. BS6, this regulates the emission of pollutants. And there are various pollutants involved like NO2, lead, etc. Not only carbon dioxide. In order to ensure that the regulations are enforced properly, we need institutions. This is the flow in which you have to go on. And you can mention few institutions in any field that you're writing the answer on. For example, we are dealing with energy efficiency. You must mention the names of institutions working in the field of energy efficiency. For example, Bureau of Energy Efficiency or Energy Efficiency Services Limited. Both these institutions work within the Ministry of Power. But Bureau of Energy Efficiency is a statutory body. It has been formed under Environmental Conservation Act. But Energy Efficiency Services Limited, this has been formed by Ministry of Power and is a collaboration of various PSUs. This is not a statutory body. Then government comes up with various schemes in various areas in order to give light to the vision of the policy and the power that the government has within legislations and regulations. In terms of energy efficiency, there has been various, various initiatives, but you have to mention few so that you complete your answer in word limit. Schemes like Ujala Street Light National Program has been used to promote the use of LED. Government of India is also encouraging supercritical thermal power plant. Supercritical thermal power plant are much more efficient than the normal thermal power plants. Their number has increased from 40 in 2015 to 66 in 2018. Government of India also has come up with perform, achieve and trade scheme, PAT scheme that gives certification for energy efficient institutions and power plants and that is tradable. Then to make the initiatives and schemes sustainable, there is always an issue of financing. Bureau of Energy Efficiency has come up with Energy Efficiency Financing Platform. Basically under this, the financing bodies like SIDB, like HSBC Bank and other institutions, they sign some kind of agreement with Bureau of Energy Efficiency. Under this, the financing institutions agree to give preferential credit to projects which implements or promotes energy efficiency. Government also has been building up infrastructure that are energy efficient. For example, Metro Rail Project. Metro is the master solution to various problems. The problems of urbanization, the problem of rapid transportation in the urban centers, the problem of connectivity, the problem of energy efficiency. Similarly, on-farm solar pumps that has been installed will not only increase energy efficiency, but will also make the farmers energy sufficient. And by pumping the energy back into the grid, they can also earn from it. Government of India has set target of ushering an era of electric mobility by 2030. The target is that by 2030, all the vehicles in India would be electric vehicles. Then of course, the success in any area would depend upon how innovatively the resources at disposal are used. There have been various innovation in the area of energy efficiency, for example, star labeling program by Bureau of Energy Efficiency. You must have seen this at your home. There are various electric equipments which are star labeled like AC, refrigerator, fans, even toasters, even the light bulbs. Those star labeling gives idea of energy efficiency. 
the five star equipments they are most energy efficient so even if the equipment costs a little more it is cheaper in long run because energy consumption will be less there will be same power output with lesser energy input so it is used as a persuasive tool that the customers see the star rating before purchasing electric equipments it will also push the manufacturers to develop energy efficient equipments similarly energy conservation building codes have been developed by various institutions to signify the energy efficiency of a building energy saving certificates are also given to the institutions and the economic units which use energy efficiently and these certificates are also tradable as in case of pat scheme but so much of effort could yield only so much of result there are certain suggestions that government must take up and incorporate there is a suggestion that bureau of energy efficiency must come up with a white paper on energy efficiency so that we understand what is the state of energy intensity in india and a clear road map can be laid according to that various organizations various institutions are working in various area of energy efficiency for example in forming the building codes or a standard and labeling programs or promoting leds or financing there must be a good coordination of state designated agencies energy service companies and public sector banks there is no platform presently where all these institutions would be coordinating the carbon certificate market in india is not very much developed there is a need for penetrating this market and accordingly some steps must be taken by bureau of energy efficiency in coordination with other regulatory bodies government of india has given a vision of ushering an era of electric mobility by 2030 there is also a suggestion that bureau of energy efficiency must come up with a cluster based approach for increasing efficiency of energy uptake by msme sector so maybe the labeling program providing energy efficient equipment on a cluster based approach can help in improving the energy efficiency of msme sector which is not very impressive we have various energy conservation building codes but these building codes are not enforced by laws so it is suggested that these code must be incorporated in bylaws of states bureau of energy efficiency must take more measures to popularize the standard and labeling program and create awareness among the customers and also increase the coverage of such program for various electrical equipments power plant is one area where energy efficiency improvement can get lots of result because energy wastage in power plants are very high so standard for lower heat rate requirement can be set and enforced by state regulatory commissions in 2016 in the prelims examination upsc has asked this question in which of the following can you find bureau of energy efficiency star label that one star two star three star four star five star that star labeling the question is talking about you can find the star labels in ceiling fans electric geysers tubular fluorescent lamps naturally you will understand that ceiling fans and electric geysers they consume lots of energy so star labeling must be applicable for them although the tubular fluorescent lamps the tube lights that we commonly see they do not consume much energy but the star labeling is available for them as well in the beginning i told you in the discussion that star labeling is available for lighting equipments as well the answer to this question was option d in the mains exam of same year there was another question related to energy efficiency the first part of the question was focused on renewable energy the second part of the question was this discuss in brief the importance of national program on light emitting diodes national program on leds well i like you to do an exercise on figuring out the importance of national program on leds think about the importance of this program from various perspective and come up with a broad answer write short points but very very broad and this time i will review your answer in the comment section there is an article on page number 5 conditions not favorable for monsoon to cover north there is an article on page number 
That means the atmospheric conditions are not favorable for advancement of monsoon towards north and northwest. This map has been released by IMD yesterday. If you look at this map, the lines in red, they represent the normal advancement of monsoon. Monsoon generally hits India in the coast of Kerala around 1st of June. And if you observe the advancement of red line, this is how it is moving in the northwest direction. Around 10th June, this is the curve for the monsoon in India. 10th June. So this entire line represents the region the monsoon has reached by 10th of June. This 15th June curve represents the region that the monsoon is covering or touching by 15th of June. And then it will advance northwestward. Today is 17th of June, so we lie between 15th June and 20th June curve. So we should be somewhere here, like this. But the actual advancement of monsoon this year has been shown by green line. You can observe one thing that monsoon has arrived early on. By 5th of June, monsoon was already covered so much of India, which is quite not normal. By 10th of June, monsoon was surpassing the region that it normally covers by 10th of June. On 17th of June, this is the region that the monsoon is touching in India. But this region has not advanced further from 9th and 10th of June to 17th of June. You can see the green line is touching very close to each other. So it's not moving in the region of Gujarat. So it is projected that for monsoon to reach till Rajasthan, the last outpost in India will take time. I'll just touch on a few very basic points to understand as to what's happening. And Tropic of Cancer passes through our state of Gujarat. In the 30 degree tropic region around Tropic of Cancer, you know that on ground, westerlies and easterlies originate like this. So on ground, there's a push of air current away from 30 degree tropics. So any atmospheric phenomena will face resistance while breaching this region. Further, if you observe, the westerlies are moving in northeast direction. The name of the winds are given according to the direction they are coming from and not the direction they are going to. The ocean currents are named according to the direction they are going to. These winds seem to be coming from southwest, so they are named westerlies. Now look at the direction of westerly. Westerly in India, around the region of Gujarat, will be going in the direction of northeast. And monsoons, as we have seen, moves in the direction of northwest. So it will face resistance from westerlies. They will be rather curved towards east. So entering into the region of Gujarat becomes difficult because of flowing westerlies. So you need some pull factor. Something that will pull up the monsoon in the northwest direction and that pulling force comes from western disturbance. Western disturbance, as the name suggests, they are disturbances, meaning they are atmospheric disturbances. They are actually extra tropical cyclones. They originate in the region of Mediterranean Sea and from there the air currents comes, picking up moisture from the Caspian Sea, passing the region of Iran, Iraq, Pakistan and then entering the northwestern region of India. That brings surprising rain before monsoon in the northwestern region of India. These extra tropical cyclones, their circulation gets coupled up by westerly jet streams. And westerly jet streams pull them up and bring it in this region of India. So that cause rainfall and these cyclonic disturbances also becomes an activating factor for the onset of monsoon. So the onset of monsoon in the north and northwestern region will be held by development of cyclonic condition, low pressure. But according to IMD, currently the low pressure is being developed over eastern region of Uttar Pradesh and some region of Bihar. So development of low pressure in the eastern region is not helping the monsoon further go into the western region. Rather, it is getting pulled up in the eastern region. Additionally, according to IMD, the western region is actually having some different kind of western disturbances. The low pressure is being formed higher up in the atmosphere. And you understand when low pressure will be there higher up in the atmosphere, that means the air currents are coming down and high pressure would be set on ground. So presently in the northwestern region, there is high pressure. So the monsoon winds, they are not getting pulled up strongly and they are facing resistance because of westerly winds. So it's going to take some time. But the good news is it's not going to take lots of time. Over Uttar Pradesh, rainfall has started already in the western region. 
and in few days the atmospheric circulation may become so that it may become favorable for the onset of monsoon and that condition is development of low pressure in the northwestern region. This article is from page number 5. Previously, Chennai Zoo has lost two lion, biological park, biological park in Jharkhand has lost lion, life of lions and tigers have been lost all over the country and such cases have been reported globally as well. That begs a question, are lions and tigers particularly vulnerable to SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus in question? To answer this question, we have to understand how SARS-CoV-2 enters a host cell. We have to look at the expression of ACE2 protein on the cell membrane of these animals. ACE2 here stands for angiotensin converting enzyme 2. It's a pressure regulating membrane protein because it is located at the outer membrane of the host cell. The spike protein of coronavirus is the defining feature of the virus. It decides the infectivity and fertility of the host. The spike protein gets attached it gets latched up with this protein on the surface of the cell. And this is step number one towards infectivity. The virus which otherwise is making round in the body through the bloodstream gets attached to this protein and stabilizes on the cell. And then the process of entering into the cell maybe through the process of endocytosis begins. So the first step of the virus to enter into the cell is stabilizing on the surface of the cell. And this stabilization happens by the spike protein getting attached with a surface protein. That surface protein happens to be angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2. It is a matter of chance that the structure of ACE2 protein is such that it fits well into the conformation into the structure of a spike protein. And that's how a latching happens. That's how a good binding between the virus and the host cell takes place. So instead of asking this question, are lions and tigers particularly vulnerable to SARS-CoV-2? We can ask this question, do lions and tigers have excessive expression or greater expression of ACE2 protein? Various studies have documented that cats and their bigger cousins, the tigers and also lions, they have been found to express ACE2 protein more significantly than other species. And the structure of ACE2 protein of these animals are quite similar to that of humans. There has been a detailed study in the University of Bologna in Italy. They have found the ACE2 protein in the GI tract of these animals. Generally, the ACE2 protein are found in the GI tracts, in lungs, in kidney, in liver. They are also found in nose, but generally they are found in these four parts of human body. A study has been published in December last year in PILOS Computational Biology. It's a very reputed journal on computational biology. They studied the affinity for binding of the ACE2 protein on the surface of the cell of different species with the virus spike protein. And they have found that the most vulnerable species to coronavirus infection next to humans are ferrets, followed by cats and then kivets. So yes, cats and the family of cats, the tigers and also lions, they are vulnerable, but they are not the most vulnerable species. So coming back to the question, are tigers and lions particularly vulnerable? The short answer is yes. The long answer is yes, because they have greater expression of ACE2 protein. There is an article on page number 7, acquitted but not forgotten. See, Delhi High Court, while recognizing the right to be forgotten, has ordered removing one of its own judgment from a leading database platform and search engines as persons should not be perpetually stigmatized for past conduct. The court also has ordered the database platform to block the judgment from being accessed by search engines. The high court recognized that the petitioner in that case whose data was to be blocked had the right to be forgotten. But this right to be forgotten must be balanced with the right of public to access Quotes of record, the right to information. And implicit in that is the right of freedom of speech, in which implicit is the right of freedom of press. Right to be forgotten is considered part of right to privacy, which has been declared as fundamental right in the Putta Swami judgment of 2017. 
The basic idea behind right to be forgotten is to hide sensitive information that information could be criminal offenses as well. If the details are found to be inadequate, irrelevant or no longer necessary to remain in the public domain. Right to be forgotten, however, is distinctly distinct from right to privacy. Right to privacy already is recognized as fundamental right in India and has a greater recognition globally compared to right to be forgotten. Because right to privacy concerns with information that is not publicly known and yet needs to be protected. But right to be forgotten involves information which are in public domain and this involves removing these information which have already been publicly known. But now the third parties should not be able to access the information. So it's a kind of denial of information to people or any other interested third party that could be press as well. So you can understand that right to be forgotten will directly come in conflict with right to information under Article 21 of Indian Constitution and right to freedom of speech and expression under Article 19. Right to be forgotten came into prominence in the famous Google case in the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice ruled that Google does not have to apply the right to be forgotten globally. The case was France versus Google. France wanted some citizens' information to be deleted from the search engine of Google. So in this peculiar case, the European Court of Justice asked Google to delete the data, but only in European Union. Google can continue to show that information in the search engine outside European Union. That may be seen as a balance between right to be forgotten and right to information. If we talk in the context of India, presently, presently, there is no legal provision in India related to right to be forgotten. Neither the IT Act 2000 or its amendment of 2008 or the IT rules of 2011, none of them deal with right to be forgotten. It's actually a new concept that is gaining prominence in India. But there are two grounds laid already for right to be forgotten to come into prominence and enforcement in near future. One is the Putta Swami judgment of 2017. In this, Supreme Court upheld right to privacy as a fundamental right and related right to be forgotten with right to privacy. It was declared that right to be forgotten is in sync with right to privacy. And right to privacy is a fundamental right under Article 21, right to life of Indian constitution. So although right to be forgotten directly not has been declared as fundamental right, but it has been linked to right to privacy, which is a fundamental right. That's first ground for right to be forgotten to be enforced in India. Another ground is Justice B. N. Sri Krishna's committee's draft on personal data protection. This draft personal data protection bill 2018, which is pending presently in the parliament, has introduced this new right to Indian citizens, right to be forgotten. This draft personal data protection bill defines right to be forgotten as the ability of an individual to limit, delink, delete or correct the disclosure of personal information on the internet that is misleading, embarrassing or irrelevant. The section 27 of the bill, it deals with this particular right elaborately. It says that a data principal has the right to prevent data fiduciary from using such data or information if data disclosure is no longer necessary. The consent to use data has been withdrawn or if data is being used contrary to the provision of the law. As you must be aware that the personal data protection bill also has a provision of taking consent from the data principle. Data principle are individuals, entity, companies whose data is being used and data fiduciary, they are individuals, companies, even the state who are processing the data. So if the data principle has withdrawn the consent or if in the opinion of the adjugating officer, the disclosure of the data or information is no longer necessary, then the data principle can prevent the data fiduciary from using that data. But in the same breath, section 27 also says that data protection authority can decide on the question of disclosure and the circumstances in which he thinks 
such disclosure can override freedom of speech and citizens right to information so data protection authority has to balance the data principle right to be forgotten and citizens right of freedom of speech and right to information so inadvertently right to be forgotten is going to bring some conflict among the provisions of indian constitution in order to smoothly implement right to be forgotten privacy needs to be added as a ground for reasonable restriction under article 192 article 192 as you would know list down six grounds in which the rights to freedom can be restricted but privacy is not one ground if that is made as a ground then the conflict between right to be forgotten and the right to freedom can be resolved so there must be a balance between the right to privacy and protection of personal data as covered under article 21 freedom of information of internet users as covered under article 19 there's a golden trinity that you must have heard and used in answers article 14 19 and 21 so far we see them in harmony and in resonance but with right to be forgotten there seems to a conflict developing among them so a comprehensive data protection law is needed to resolve the issue and minimize these conflict with this we have come to the end of the session the answer to yesterday's question of the day and today's question of the day are there on the screen please attempt the question write your answer in the comment section have some fruitful discussion and also try to attempt the dns quiz on the elearn platform thank you very much for being with me for 35 minutes goodbye take care